Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Uh, today I want to talk about a condition called euthyroid sick syndrome. And we're going to talk about how this condition um, relates to low T3. And we're going to talk about how low T3 and euthyroid sick syndrome, which is abbreviated ESS, um, relate to uh, thyroid testing and how it can impact your thyroid labs and make the whole uh, picture a little bit confusing. So um, let, let's jump in here. This might be a topic that, or the, the name of this disease might not be something that you're familiar with. Um, you might know it as low T3 syndrome, but I can almost guarantee that your doctor knows about this term because it's, it's a term that's used um, and it's seen a lot in the hospital. So if any doctor has been um, inside the, the hospital or especially the ICU, then they're really familiar with this syndrome. Um, so let me just define it and then we'll talk about uh, the difference between what I'm calling the chronic uh, euthyroid sick syndrome versus the acute uh, sort of euthyroid sick syndrome that most uh, doctors are probably aware of and maybe that's what you know it by. So anyway, this condition is also called um, non-thyroidal illness. Um, or NTIS uh, for short. And what it is basically is we can break apart the name to help us understand what it means. So euthyroid, so let's just break it up, euthyroid sick syndrome. Euthyroid means normal thyroid function. Sick refers to just the state of your body, right? So if you're have an illness, you're considered to be sick. And then, of course, syndrome is a constellation of findings, um, which all tie together, and that's generally what we call a syndrome. So what they're saying here, if we break down this name, they're saying there's um, there are changes which occur to your thyroid function when you are sick. Um, however, it doesn't mean that your thyroid is actually having or malfunctioning or having an issue with it. So you thyroid, normal thyroid function, even though you're sick, and then all of the changes that we see in this condition, we call it this, we call it a syndrome. And so what this is really is it's a condition that is seen especially in people who are really sick, usually in the ICU. So if you come in um, to the hospital, you probably, you know, you, you would be, most of the time, people aren't aware of their visits if they're really sick um, for a number of reasons. But let's just say um, you come into the hospital, you're diagnosed with like sepsis or pneumonia, you go into the ICU. Um, doctors know that if they checked your thyroid function, that everything would be wonky, okay? That's why they, they almost refuse to check um, TSHs in the hospital. In fact, I remember when I was in residency, um, our attendings when we were um, admitting people from the, from the ER, if they ever saw um, a TSH, they would usually be upset about it because it would always be abnormal. And now you're put in this weird situation where you're like, okay, is it actually real? Is it not real? Um, you know, does this person have thyroid disease? Is their medication off or what? You just don't know. And so <laughs> it's kind of sad, but it's true. Most doctors just say, well, then just, I don't want to know if it's abnormal because then they're not responsible for treating it. It's a bad way of approaching thyroid disease, but, but this does actually occur behind the scenes just for what it's worth. So anyway, that's how people understand you thyroid sick syndrome. But what they take it to mean is that it's a normal physiologic response that the body goes through when you are sick. Okay, so if you are dying of sepsis um, and pneumonia in the ICU, does it make sense for your body to try and grow hair follicles, or does it make sense for your body to bolster its immune system to try and kill the infection that's trying to kill you? Okay, so what is felt, um, th these changes are probably some physiologic protective mechanism meant to help your body get better in times of illness. And that makes sense, okay? And this goes by several different names. Low T3 syndrome, okay? And you just you can identify this based off of lab testing. Um, it can also be called low T3 slash or dash low T4 syndrome because both of those labs can be um, abnormal. Or it can be called high T4 syndrome. These are all names for the same um, uh, these are all, actually I should say these are patterns um, which are all seen in euthyroid 6 syndrome or ESS and so they all kind of get different names. But make no mistake, we're really sort of talking about this same entity. Now the problem is with this entity um, is that doctors think, and I would say this has re been relatively true for, for most of um, for a long time, that this sort of syndrome, this constellation of, of symptoms and lab abnormalities is only seen in people that are acutely and seriously ill. Now, I would contend with that statement by saying, I think what we have now is a population that is growing sicker and sicker as, as we go on. The population in general has more metabolic dysfunction. Um, the, our diets are, are you know worse than they've ever been. We have you know increasing tax on the body due to nutrient deficiencies. 
all sorts of problems which are causing chronic illness. And the chronic illness that we see is manifested by metabolic dysfunction. You may have high blood pressure, you may have high cholesterol, you may have thyroid disease, you may have PCOS, you may have premature ovarian issues and low progesterone and high estrogen. These are all consequences of chronic illnesses, you know, lots of stress, etc. There's a lot of reasons for this, but what I'm trying to say is it's normal nowadays for you to be under a lot of stress. And I'm arguing here that it's the reason that we have so such a big issue, or one of the reasons I should say, with treating thyroid disease is that there are many, many people out there who are suffering from a chronic version of U thyroid six syndrome. And the reason that this occurs, uh, there's lots of studies and I, I talk about some of them here. So you might say, well, why do you get this ESS thing? And, and we'll talk about it in just a second. But um, really it is believed that due to illness or stress or physiologic issues, um, there's these factors negatively impact the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, right? This is the axis that is in your brain. So your hypothalamus and pituitary, those two um, organs and tissues talk to your thyroid gland, which is in your neck, and then they tell the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. So if you have a blunting of that response at the level of the brain due to perceived um, illness or perceived chronic stress, then the amount of thyroid hormone that you will produce is diminished. Okay. So this sort of, this, this stress on the body impa impacts TRH and TSH. And these are the hormones that are produced by your hypothalamus and your pituitary, which leads to decreased stimulation of the thyroid gland, which then leads to decreased production of thyroid hormones. So there's some sort of there's some sort of response that the body goes through on, when it's acutely ill or it's chronically ill that suppresses the TRH and the TSH and that affects thyroid hormone in the body. Now, but that's not the only that's not the only reason that this occurs, right? So there's um, other issues such as alterations to thyroid uh, hormone binding globulins in the serum. Um, it alters the way that your thyroid metabol or alters the way that your body metabolizes thyroid hormone. So remember, if we go back to thyroid physiology 101. Um, well, maybe this isn't 101, but whatever. Uh, <clears throat> we know that in order for thyroid hormone to become active, it needs to be, it needs to have an iodine cleaved off of it um, in order to be activated. And so that process is known as thyroid um, conversion and thyroid metabolism. And so if that isn't occurring, then you get some characteristic changes. And so this chronic stress like state may cause issues with the metabolism of thyroid hormones. And, um, and We'll, we'll talk about some, some more about this and just sex symptoms and, and so on and so forth. But what I want to say here is that these concepts and everything that I'm talking about, they're, they're, they're not disputed by any physician. So it's not like this is fringe science. This is, this is well established in the literature. The, the reason and the causes for the, you know, why these things occur is well established and it's been known for a very long time. What I'm suggesting is the new part. Um, and I, I believe this to be the case. Right now, um, you know, like I said, right now with the amount of information that I know, it's subject to change in the future. But I think what you are seeing now is instead of all of these things that I just described happening in acute illness in which you are in the ICU, you know, really, really, really ill, um, and and in, in that setting it would be considered normal. What I'm saying now is that that has sort of transferred um, and is now impacting thyroid function because people are chronically ill now. And by chronically ill, I'm talking about the chronic stressors, the nutrient deficiencies, and so on. So what we are seeing now is all of these effects, but on people who are not in the hospital anymore, right? And so what happens to this pe this population that is walking around, but stressed out of their mind because they have so you know problems with um, relationship issues or problems with work or you know other health problems or all sorts of issues they're now walking around and they have a chronic ESS like syndrome and that is a syndrome that when they go into the doctor because they're feeling crummy because they're feeling crappy they go in and they are told that their thyroid is normal and obviously it isn't right and so that's where that's where I think this sort of all comes back into play and so if you think about this and here's why this can be a little bit confusing. And I don't talk about this in the article, but um, it's easier to say it verbally than it is to write about it. But when I, when I say here that one of the reasons that this occurs, um, that this ESS uh, occurs, is because there's a negative impact um, on TRH and TSH. And so traditionally, we think of thyroid hypothyroidism um, as a state which results in high TSH. So when you go to your doctor and they order a TSH, um, well, that's what they're going to do. If you come in and you say it's my thyroid, they're going to order a TSH automatically, and that's how they're going to assess whether or not your thyroid is functioning. Now, the problem is there's a lot of people who can have a normal or even low TSH without being on thyroid hormone, and then they're said to be completely normal. 
But I just told you that one of the one of the ways that um, this ESS-like syndrome affects thyroid function is by suppressing your TSH, which means that if your hypothalamus is not speaking to the thyroid gland, it's actually going to look like you're hyperthyroid, even though you're hypothyroid. So the classic presentation in terms of your labs for this condition is a low to normal TSH, a low to normal T3, a low to normal T4, and a normal to high reverse T3. So all of those, if you don't have an idea of how this physiologically occurs in the body, will look like somebody has a completely normal thyroid. And I think that is the big problem here. And I think that's why so many people um, are struggling with um, being diagnosed. So this is a, actually a very important concept, I think, um, especially if you have thyroid disease. But I think that what I'm describing here um, isn't exactly um, verified in the literature, at least yet, but I think it will be over time as we begin to understand um, thyroid function um, and how stressors and nutrient deficiencies, physiologic stress, trauma, things like that impact thyroid function in the long term. We absolutely know, and you cannot deny it or argue it, that acute and cr uh, acute issues cause thyroid dysfunction. What what we're we don't quite know or haven't we don't haven't developed a large enough body of evidence to prove that chronic stressors does the exact same thing. Um, but I think it does, and I think that that will eventually come to light over time. So anyway, let's go back to ESS, and does it cause symptoms? So this is where it can kind of be confusing. Um, in general, if, if you listen to what I said before, in the acute sort of uh, issue, like you're in the ICU, it's, it's probably not going to cause symptoms that you can, uh, that, or at least symptoms that you can identify, right? It's hard to tell that you're fatigued or that you're constipated when you're in the hospital in an ICU bed, you know, on three antibiotics because you're septic. That, it's going to be difficult to differentiate symptoms. However, in the outpatient, it's a different story. You might actually be ill and you might actually be sick. And if you are going to be sick and if you're going to have symptoms, then they will be the typical, typical symptoms associated with hypothyroidism. So there will be things like weight gain, cold intolerance, pain, chronic pain especially, hair loss or increased um, or in, inability to grow hair, cold body temperature, especially when you check your basal body temperature, slow heart rate, especially if it's resting, uh, menstrual issues, fatigue, low energy. I mean, you guys probably know most of the symptoms of hypothyroidism by now, but that's how it would present. So we kind of already talked about this. I kind of jumped the gun and talked about all this stuff. Um, but basically, what I'm trying to say here is that it's the chronic issue that causes the problem. Okay, it's not... If, if you just get a little bit stressed out for, let's say, a period of three to four months, there might be some physiologic changes to thyroid function, but it's not the type of stuff that I think will persist long term. However, if that happens um, and that triggers an autoimmune disease and then that, tr you know, and then also you have a little bit of high blood pressure that you're taking medication for um, and then, you know, whatever, then you have spousal issues or, you know, and then things just start t t stacking on top of each other. That's when you get into problems. That's the sort of chronic stress that I'm talking about. And it might take years to do this, but think about it. Think about over your life. Think about the amount of stress that you've been under um, uh, for various reasons. When I was, when I would see patients, I would kind of ask them and I would have them tell me about when did they first notice their thyroid issues. And almost all of them would tell me a history about some big event that usually triggered, triggered everything. And then from there, it just got worse and worse and worse. And so you can kind of do this exercise back in your head and think back, on, you know, in your own mind, when did all of your symptoms start? Was it after some big event? Um, if it was, and you don't have Hashimoto's, then you might have some of this this sort of issue that I'm talking about, this ESS-like um, um, problem. Now, let me say here, the reason I talk about low T3 versus youth th thyroid 6 syndrome versus regular hypothyroidism is that this is its own entity. So if you're listening to this and you're saying, well, that sounds interesting, um, or this might be me, this is just a cause of thyroid dysfunction. I don't even think that a lot, necessarily a large portion of people fit into this category, but I still think it's an important category nonetheless, which is why we're talking about it. So perhaps only something like five to 10% of people, I'm making that number up, but you get an idea, might actually suffer from this issue. Not everyone will, but it's still worth understanding. Um, so I talk about low T3 versus ESS here. Um, and really, I think, I think there are sort of low T3 and ESS can be sort of similar syndromes um, in and of themselves. So I don't think there's there's a big, a uh, huge difference, except in terms of if it should be treated or not. Now, prevailing prevailing thought right now is that ESS, if you notice it, should not be treated. Now, whether your doctor 
thinks or, or knows that you have it and this is his logic or her logic. Um, that, that could be the case. I, I highly doubt it, but it could be. But I think what you have is you have a, you have a, a potential to either treat it or not. And the prevailing thought right now is actually it shouldn't be treated. But what I would argue is somewhere probably around half of people who have this condition should be treated with thyroid hormone and the other half should not. So you sort of have to figure out where you fall into this, um, this categorization. The people that tend to do better on treatment are those who tend to be severely symptomatic. And by severe, I mean more than a little fatigue, more than a little weight gain. You know, there's no, this is somewhat ambiguous, but you can kind of put it in your head as to what you think would be severe or not. If you're floating around at, let's say, 80% of normal, it's probably not very severe, but 60% of normal might be. And so there's, a, there's actually a good reason to try and not use thyroid hormone if possible. Um, because the idea is this, the reason that your thyroid is having issues is not because you inherently have a thyroid issue to begin with, it's because of some sort of stressful um, or, or illness or whatever it is, is causing dysfunction at the physiologic level. So the best, best case scenario is to actually remove that stressor, to impact that in some way, that then that will sort of you know, lift the brakes or, or stop the brakes on, on the thyroid physiology and it will return to normal. Now that's ideal. That's how it should work if you can. However, at some point, if your thyroid function has been suppressed for so long and you have persistent thyroid dysfunction, then it's going to be hard, even if you remove the stimulus, to get back to normal because thyroid, thyroid issues, are, they're going to drag down other hormones in your body. So it's going to affect your testosterone, your estrogen, your progesterone, your cortisol, etc. So if you've been depressed for so long, and I don't mean depressed, like emotionally depressed, or I mean like thyroid function as being depressed, if that has been low for so long, it's unlikely that just managing those symptoms or just managing the stress will be sufficient to relieve all of your symptoms. So that sort of has to be dealt with on an individual basis. But what I want you to take from this is that there is no universal truth as it relates to treatment. So it's not like everyone with ESS should be treated and or nobody should ESS should be treated. Instead, you should sort of evaluate it on a case by case, case, by case basis um, and determine from there. I go into a lot more detail here. Um, you know, so, so if you want to um, come to this post and you can read it, um, but there's, there's some things that I'm saying on here that I've, I've verbally said that I haven't put in writing and, and there's things on the blog post that I haven't said out loud either. So anyway, you probably have to go to two if you're really interested in this. But anyway, I do highlight here that whenever possible, your goal should be to treat the underlying dysfunction, which may cause the abnormal lab results. But in some cases, this may not be possible. So that's essentially what I just was saying. In terms of treatment, most of the time, you're going to need to use a T3 medication if you have low T3 syndrome and true ESS in this sort of chronic setting. The reason for that is the, the blunting, if you remember, if we go way back to the beginning of this conversation, I said one of the problems um, of ESS is that you have disordered thyroid metabolism and conversion. So it doesn't make sense to give someone T4 in the setting because they're not, probably not going to be able to convert it very well. So instead of doing that, you bypass the conversion process by giving someone directly T3. And so that, that's a whole other topic. I've talked about how to use lyothyronine and cytomel and all sorts of things in the past. Um, so you can go back to those videos and, and blog posts, etc. But just to put that out there that usually people who have this condition will need those medications um, to get, I, I think, to get better. Now the duration of treatment varies, but it's actually usually not permanent, by the way. That's another beneficial thing. So a, a, an, a, sort of a temporary episodic treatment of, you know, on the order of months, not usually years, by the way. Um, is usually sufficient to fix this problem, and then the person can go off thyroid medication, and they're usually they're usually better at that point. So anyway, um, wrapping this all up, I think that there is a case to be made that there's an emerging thyroid disease and, and dysfunction that I would lump into sort of this chronic ESS-like category that has some very specific changes. Now remember, this entity is just a cause of thyroid dysfunction. If you have thyroid disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's caused by this, however it might be. And so the characteristics that, that help you know if you have this sort of syndrome has to do with, you can look at your labs, so remember the, the pattern that I described in the beginning, um, and then also the, your symptoms, and then your responsiveness to other medications. So if you go into the doctor and you have this and he treats you or she treats you with T4 and you don't get better, then maybe this, this, this might be part of your issue. So anyway, that's, that's sort of wrapping this up. I know this is kind of a, um, kind of a uh, complex topic, um, 
but um, I, th I think I think you guys can handle it. Um, if you have any questions specifically about this, let me know. Leave them in the comment section. Um, I'll do my best to get back and to answer them. Um, but anyway, I hope that guy, I hope this was helpful for you guys.